Hello, welcome to week one, which I am calling Horror, Gender, and the Pleasures of Spectatorship. This lecture will focus on the fly and aliens. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that this I will be posting this lecture in its PDF form to the website, so if you would prefer not to watch this video, that's also fine. You can also read through the lecture on your own. Some key concepts I want to cover in this lecture include the Bechdel test, the male gaze in narrative film. I want to go over body genres, how horror genres give rise to different viewing pleasures and identifications, and I also want to contrast the psychodynamic feminist approaches to horror films with alternative models offered by some of the critics that we're reading for this week. The Bechdel test uh, is a tool for feminist inquiry into film and fiction. It asks whether a work of fiction features at least two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. The test is used as an indicator for the active presence of women in film and other fictions and to call attention to gender inequality in fiction. Um, and it, it refers to this comic strip. Um, the artist's name was Bechdel. And that sort of lays out these rules. And you can see in this, I, I realize this is a grainy image, but... You can see in the last frame here, um, the last movie that the, this woman was able to see was Alien, which is one reason I wanted to include this. Um, Alien, both Alien and Aliens, its sequel, which I had you watch for this week, both pass the Bechdel test, but um, The Fly, however, does not. It, it, the Fly includes two women, but their exchange is very much mediated by Brundle's sexual drive. Um... Laura Mulvey, in her 1975 article, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, introduces the idea of the male gaze. She demonstrates how the unconscious of patriarchal society has structured film form. She notes how the Hollywood style of popular film emerged from its skilled manipulation of visual pleasure and mainstream film coded, and how mainstream film coded the erotic into the language of the dominant patriarchal order. She seeks to negate the ease and plenitude of the narrative of fiction film. She argues that the pleasure that pleasure in film involves looking and being looked at. So she breaks this idea into two parts. Scopophilia involves taking other people as objects by subjecting them to a controlling and curious gaze. Voyeurism, on the other hand, another type of pleasure, um defines pleasure when it comes from watching an objectified other. The mass of mainstream film plays on voyeuristic fantasy. Scopophilia arises from the pleasure in using another person as an object of sexual stimulation through sight, but the other aspect of the pleasurable structure of looking in, cin in cinema contrasts this and comes from identification with the image seen. So, pleasure in looking, according to Mulvey, is split between an active male and a passive female. The male gaze upholds woman as the image, and man as bearer of the look. Women displayed function as either erotic object for the characters and as erotic object for the spectator. When film focuses on a fragment of the female body, it positions spectator and male character in the same gazing position. The male figure cannot bear the burden of sexual objectification. Man is reluctant to gaze at his exhibitionist-like. This is why men must make things happen, further the narrative. This is why the male character is supposed to be someone with whom the spectator can identify, a main male protagonist. The spectator is invited to possess the female exhibition as the narrative progresses, and as her eroticism becomes subjected to the male star alone. In short, the image of the woman as passive material for the active gaze of a man becomes the dominating structure of narrative cinema. Woman as representation signifies castration, including voyeuristic or fetishistic mechanisms to circumvent her threat. According to Mulvey, there are also three looks associated with cinema, which are first the camera as it records the pro-filmic event, which is kind of capturing the action on film initially. The second is the audience watching the final product, which happens when you go to the movies. And third, the characters watching each other within the film. 
The conventions of narrative film deny the first two looks and subordinate them to the third in order to prevent a distancing awareness in the audience. Fictional reality and truth depend on the first two being disguised, but the, fem the female image as a castration threat bursts through the, the world of illusion as a one-dimensional fetish. fetish. So what, what Mulvey's pointing out is how inimical it is that patri patriarchy is so naturalized um, in, in narrative cinema that we, we don't even really notice it when it's happening, right? And we can maybe see examples of this. A question we can ask is, where do we see this in the, mo the films we watched this week? Um, one example might be Ronnie pulling up her stocking, or pulling off her stocking, or these images of um, Ripley in her underwear, right? Um, but it's interesting that to note that Ronnie at some point also is kind of in charge of what we are looking at um, when he, as here when she's filming Brundle do his experiment. And same thing in Aliens when Ripley is sort of watching the um, soldiers from behind the scenes from a screen. And here you can see that this, this gaze is kind of shared by both Ripley, um, by both masculine and, fe and feminine audiences, right? So, in another article, The Terror of Pleasure, Tanya Modaleski also takes up this question of pleasure in viewing, but begins by looking at the pleasure of consuming more generally, right? Um, I want to think about how her argument adds to or contends with Mulvey's theorization of the male gaze. Modaleski argues that increased leisure time is bought at the price of spiritual zombieism, um, that pleasure is a way of keeping the masses unaware of their own desperate vacuity. And she reads horror film as a critique of, of capitalism. While mass culture lures its audiences to a false complacency with the promise of equally false insipid pleasures, horror film provides a contrast. Horror films engage with the ideological apparatuses of the family and school. Horror film protagonists are celebrated for their adversarial relation to contemporary culture and society, and are celebrated as other to culture and society, right? One example she gives is in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, that embodies a critique of capitalism in how the, the monster is kind of the family unit. Zombies take over a shopping center in Dawn of the Dead might be another example, um, which and this plays on the fears of cultural critics who envision masses as kind of zombie consumers. And in a way, all zombie movies kind of participate in this critique of capitalism. Um, another example she points to is Cronenberg's Videodrome, um, where video itself is the monster. Um, victims cannot distinguish reality from hallucination. Modaleski also points out three ways in which the novelistic as family romance is dismantled by horror. First, horror th thwarts closure. Second, horror dispenses with or minimizes the plot and character development that is essential to the construction of the novelistic. Narrative itself is disordered and dismembered. And again, I'd really like you to keep in mind Frankenstein as, as I'm going through this as well. Um, I think it would be an interesting paper to sort of see how horror is doing these things, but also how... Um, the novel Frankenstein is also dismantling some novelistic structures. And the third thing she points out is that horror makes narcissistic identification on the part of the audience increasingly difficult, right? So whereas Mulvey is pointing out that we're supposed to identify with this male protagonist, that's really hard to do in a, in a horror film. Um, and we can see how both of the films we watched for this week, Aliens and the Fly, sort of um, are doing these things, uh, thwarting cl closure perhaps more most evidently in the way that, you know, Aliens has several sequels. I think there are like seven Alien movies. Um, but also Ronnie, it's unclear whether or not Ronnie at the end of the film gets an abortion. Um, that's kind of left open. The film kind of ends before that's resolved, right? And so two questions can emerge from Modaleski's work here. The first, what does horror do to the idea of the male gaze 
as we've understood it. If the audience cannot identify with a specific male protagonist, how does the genre of horror work as a critique of the male gaze? Um, one thing she points out is that audiences cheer for Leatherface in cult screenings of um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which happened today, right? So horror positions the point of view... Um, the, horror positions the viewer in the point of view of the slasher. Um, which, again, we can think of what does this do to the conception of Mulvey's gaze? How does it, you know, does it emphasize what Mulvey suggests is usually a subtle convention of filmmaking, that the male gaze is actively, actively objectifying a sexualized passive woman? Or does it work to critique the male gaze somehow? Um, and we can think more about how this is sort of operating in the films we, work, we watched this week, too. Um, but in short, the masses sort of revel in the de demise of the very culture they appear to enthusiastically support. Pleasure in the pejorative sense is personified as a female deity. In horror, pleasure is personified as a young school teacher, female, um, being beaten to death, raped, murdered, etc. The female is attacked not because she embodies sexual pleasure, but because she represents a great many aspects of the specious good. In this way, the horror film can align itself with Mulvey's critique of the male gaze, even as it reinforces the objectification of the female subject, right? I'm going to show in a minute how another critic, um, Linda Williams, points out that the woman is usually placed on the side of the monster, even when she is a victim, particularly in, in a creature feature. Um, but woman is also associated with the monster of mass culture. Mass culture is terrifying because of the way it feminizes its audience. Film the film's failure to affect closure or to elicit narcissistic identification is reasserted through the projecting through projecting the experience of submission and defenselessness onto a female body. The female spectator is the one deprived of solace and pleasure, and male spectator distance a male spectator distances himself somewhat from the terror. Um, so women are denied pleasure at the same time that they are scapegoated for seeming to represent it. A second question that can emerge from Modaleski's reading is, does Shelley's Frankenstein set a precedent for this film genre by dismantling the novelistic as a family romance? Or does her novel depend on such narrative strategies? Um, again, I think this would make for a really interesting final paper if you've started to think about that already. Um, but she points out that classical narrative films work to conceal the tropes of horror, uh, a lack of progressive order and a film where the spectator subject is never reassured within a dominant system of production and consumption. Uh, Williams argues that body genre um, works against the classical Hollywood style, which is defined by goal-oriented linear narratives driven by the desire of a single protagonist involving one or two lines of action leading to definite closure. And horror, Modaleski points out, seems to be disrupting this kind of simple narrative. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about body genre, too. So Linda Williams, in her article, Film Bodies, Gender, Genre, and Excess, um, analyzes the form, function, and system of gratuitous excesses of horror, pornography, and melodrama. Those are the three body genres that Williams identifies in film. These genres of film are defined by their differences from classical realist styles of narrative cinema. Um, again, seeming to work, work against Mulvey's claim who focuses on traditional narrative cinema, right? So there's this way in which horror kind of works in a different way than the framework that Mulvey is proposing. Um, por pornography and horror are two systems of excess. These rank very low on a hierarchy of cultural esteem. And scholars of melodrama concentrate on how the form exceeds the normative system of much narrative cinema. Um, Williams is interested in chick flick melodramas or w films that sort of are designed to appeal to a female audience um, in their traditional status under patriarchy, right? So some of the similarities she points out between these three genres, um, pornography, horror, and melodrama, um, include, first, the, 
the spectacle of the body is caught in the grip of intense sensation or emotion. It's kind of happening in all of these. Second, body genres focus on a form of ecstasy, sexual incite, excitement, or rapture. Third, each genre visually shares a quality of uncontrollable convulsion or spasm, pleasure, fear, or anguish, right? These genres encourage a bodily reaction of orgasm associated with pornography, fear, terror, or scream associated with horror, and crying or weeping versus the melodrama, um, in terms of the melodrama. So I think this is so, I think this genre is so interesting because she's actually talking about how audiences physically react to these three kinds of movies and how the films are designed to elicit that physical reaction, right? Four, the bodies of women figure as the primary embodiment of pleasure, fear, and pain. Although pleasure of viewing has traditionally been constructed for masculine spectators in again, as Mulvey sort of outlines, um, as well as with heterosexual pornography, the female body in grips of ecstasy offers a more sensational sight. And the fifth thing that she points out as kind of un unifying these different genres is that they're all of very low cultural status, right? The marker of low cultural status is the way the spectator's body mimics the emotions or sensations of the female body on screen. The success of these three body genres is measured by the degree to which the audience's sensation mimics the one on screen, um, which I think further complicates Modaleski's obser observation of how horror changes the male gaze, uh, because the spectator is not just the slasher, but is also the feminized spectator screaming because we are being chased as well. So horror just sort of complicates the, the kind of simple idea that um, the spectator is necessarily a man or masculine. Some of the differences that Williams, well, the main difference, I guess, that Williams points out is that these different genres are made for different gendered audiences. Porn, porn she says, is aimed at active men, um, active in the sense of masturbating, uh, while melodrama is aimed at passive or crying women, horror she identifies as being aimed at adolescents careening between masculine and feminine poles. Body genres can reinforce the male gaze. I think it's important to point out. Tear jerkers can commit a kind of violence in the targeted female audience through textual rape, Feminizing through pathos, as Mary Ann Doan points out. Um, feminist critics of pornography argue that women are objectified victims of pornographic representations and the, that porn, pornography can celebrate and anticipate female victim, victimization in real life. On the other hand, um, Body genres can also push against the male gaze, right? The pleasures of film spectatorship are by definition perversions, right? Fetishism, voyeurism, sadism, masochism, sexual excesses. But the perverse pleasures of film viewing are also the conventions of film. They are normal. The terms of perversion used to describe the normal pleasure of film viewing are ambiguous. And I think that's the, the important point to take away from this. Um... Dalamore argues we are all perverts, right? The three body genres she discusses here offer spectacle, a spectacle of feminine victimization and each hinge on a spectacle of a sexually saturated female body, though the victimization differs and cannot be explained by an oppressive male gaze in each case. Because women must do the sexual acts in pornography, pornography is sadistic, whereas weepies and melodramas are more masochistic spectacles. In horror, women are victims of sadism, but also oscillate between masochistic, masochistic and sadistic poles. Pleasure for the masculine-identified viewer oscillates between initial passive powerlessness and the terrorized girl victim and her later, her later active empowerment. When, terrorized, when a terrorized woman fights back, the viewer identification shifts from abject terror gendered feminine to active power with bisexual components. 
gender confused a gender confused monster is foiled and symbolically castrated by an androgynous final girl in short pornography's appeal to male viewers is sadistic horror films horror's appeal to um, an emerging sexual identity of adolescence is sadomasochistic and women's films or melodramas appeal to female spectatorship in a more masochistic way. Masochistic pleasure for women women is often ignored in criticism for being too normal or too perverse to be taken seriously as pleasure. Uh, Williams argues that we need to pay attention to how torture on the bodies of women makes an appeal to women, and it's not just allied with sexualized viewing power. Um... She also points out that Clover's bisexual model of viewer identification stresses a sadomasochistic component of each body genre by appropriating melodramatic fantasies. Each genre offers melodramatic elements of sexually explicit relations. In displays of feminine masochistic suffering, the woman victim experiences elements of either power or pleasure. In horror film, the sexually active bad girls are killed off and non-sexual good girls survive. Good girls appropriate phallic power as long as it is separated from pleasure. Female identification is muddy in a weepy or a melodrama because there are so many women. Identification is neither fixed nor entirely passive. Williams argues that the subject position constructed by these genres are not as gender-linked as has been supposed. Women, women do watch hardcore porn, right, is one of her points. Gen the genres of porn... Um, which can show this sort of bisexual oscillation between viewing points, uh, breaks down the fundamental taboo against gay sex and breaks down the male gaze. Um, a new fluidity and oscillation permits new constructions of feminine viewing pleasures once thought not to exist at all. And I think what this, what this makes us question maybe in Aliens is um, why... Vasquez, who's kind of the more, one of the one of the women who goes in to fight the aliens, but who is definitely like a more masculine type of female. Um, why does she die in the film, and why did Newt and Ripley live? Um, is it because she's sexually active or too masculine? Um, it's an interesting question, one you could perhaps address in your post for this week. So, what kind of what kind of spectatorship is going on in the two films that I had you watch for this week? Um, do we see a male gaze? Do we see a more oscillating bisexual gaze going on? Um, the <coughs> we, we get this sort of first-person camera when Ripley goes in to, to sort of torch the mother alien. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but when she's going down the stairs, we get this first-person point-of-view shot which is reminiscent, I think, of slasher films, where Ripley sort of becomes the slasher. Um, and same thing when we're watching, we're sort of watching Ronnie watch um, Brundle do this display of, of um, his, his masculine body here. Um, I think a question, you know, the man re remains active in this shot, even if he does not possess the, the male gaze, the gaze in this in this shot. Um, but the woman also seems passive in the way that she's kind of watching his body. So I'm just interested in what, what kinds of spectatorship you see going on in these films. Um, finally, the... One of the articles I had you read for this week by Cynthia Freeland, Feminist Frameworks for Horror Films... Uh, critiques the psychodynamic trend of feminist approaches to horror and seeks instead to interrogate the gender ideology of horror. So she sort of wants to move away from this psych these psychoanalytic frameworks, um, which she sort of names as Mulvey-Lacanian versus Creed-Christavian. Um, we have seen how Mulvey and Williams rely on psychoanalysis, but... She gives us a breakdown of Kristeva's argument, who locates the origin of horror not in the castration anxiety 
but in the pre-edible stage of the infant's ambivalence towards the mother as it struggles to create its own ego identity. Kristeva emphasizes the mother as horrific for being primitive, impure, or defiled, and emphasizes the duality of our attraction or repulsion to the horrific. Creed applies Kristeva to alien and aliens. Um, the alien mother is monstrous and repeats birth scenarios. Creed emphasizes that horror concerns not just women as victims of monstrous women, but who threaten to castrate men. Uh, I'm sorry. Creed emphasizes that horror concerns not just women as victims of monstrous women who threaten to castrate men. She's arguing that horror illustrates work of abjection in three ways, right? So first, horror depicts images of abjection like corpses and bodily waste. Second, horror is concerned with borders. And that's, again, why, why we could potentially consider both of these films for this week as frontier narratives, which Rushing talks about. And we, because they, um, the monsters are threatening the symb stability of the symbolic order, which I think Brundlefly is a great example of. Um, and hor third, horror also constructs the maternal figure as abject. So um, Freeland rejects both of these psychodynamic frameworks and then offers six objections, which I'm not going to get into, but she, she just sort of points out how it's limiting, too reductive um, to focus on psycho psychoanalysis because they also depend upon these basic female-male distinctions that are being questioned by feminists, and these approaches can often ignore viewers' interest and responses. So she's highlighting the limitations of psychodynamic approaches. Um... And she, one thing I think that she points out that's really smart is that she, that um, horror originates in the Gothic novel, right? Where women writers and readers were very prevalent. And again, that's one reason that we're sort of tracing the emergence of this genre in film from Frankenstein in this class. She also points out how feminist investigations can be extra filmic on the one hand, where Questions are asked about how women's motives and experiences um, produce film uh, in writing, producing, directing, acting, making of horror films, right? And how audiences receive horror or who locate horror in specific cultural and historical moments. Or they can also be intrafilmic investigations, which might ask questions that focus on the representational contents and on the nature of representational practices in order to scrutinize how films represent gender, sexuality, and power relations between the sexes. Her, her proposed framework for feminist ideology critique um, offers some strategies. So we can look at plot, characters, and point of view, or examine their gender ideology and how films model a distorted representation of existing relations of power and domination between genders. What messages about gender is the film naturalizing or expecting the audience to accept unquestioningly? How is the subordination of women perpetuated in these films by its structures? One could observe how images of women are present in the film. Do women have agency as knowers and sufferers? What role do they play in relation to men? Um, with her proposed feminist ideology critique, she seeks to emphasize films as complex artifacts which represent more than just characters. She also seeks to look below the surface of the male-female presentations to consider gaps, presumptions, and what might be repressed in the text. So, and she also offers, again, she contrasts, well, she doesn't, yeah, um, she offers a reading of both The Fly and Jurassic Park. Um, and I want to think about Jurassic Park for next week. Uh, but for now... The Fly, she, she points out that Gina Davis's character, Veronica, or Ronnie, as she's called in the film, um, is a strong, successful career woman. She can be read as either a fantasy woman for male sexual desire, again, which maybe that stocking scene sort of highlights, um, or she can be read as assertive about her own sexual desires. Um, Freeland kind of seems unsure about which one we should go with. 
So I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about Veronica and how she's represented. Um, however, Freeland points out that Ronnie only exists in relation to men as subordinate. She has a dependent relationship on Brundle, the tragic hero. Uh, the horrific threat in this film is an invasion by the other species of both the male and the female body. Freeland reads Brundlefly's transformation as a metaphor for aging, cancer, or for the AIDS ec epidemic. Again, this film came out in 1986, so I think that's an important um, context to keep in mind. The male scientist exceeds his role and must pay for it. The man acts, whereas the woman feels. Veronica's tragedy is only a subordinate tragedy to Brundle's mistake. She loses a lover and forces an abortion. At least according to Freeland. Again, I, I'm not sure that the film resolves the whole abortion issue. I mean, it's very clear that she doesn't want the the offspring or whatever it may be inside of her, but um, the film ends before she actually gets the abortion. In The Fly, Veronica's suffering cues audiences to pity Brundle's predicament. Um, in both The Fly and Jurassic Park, the ideological message is sort of reinforced that women are primarily creatures of their, own, their emotions who exist in relation to men and their offspring. She chooses to look at these two films because they offer strong depictions of women whose depictions are undermined by a deeper ideological message. Um, we can all, but we can think about, you know, what, why is Ronnie crying at the end of the, this movie when she has to shoot Brundlefly? Um... Is it because she loves him? Is it because she's just terrified? I think there is a couple different ways we could read that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, and the other article I wanted you to read for this week was J Janice Hawker Rushing's piece on, on aliens. Um, similar to how Freeland provides an alternative framework for the psych psychodynamic feminist approaches to horror, Rushing also works against a psychodynamic framework but focuses on myth and archetype rather than gender ideology. Rushing traces the evolution of the feminine in archetypal and American rhetorical forms. The frontier myth is a middle stage of the whole feminine being split by the development of patriarchy. In the patriarchal myth of the frontier, women are dominated by men, they are supplements to a male narrative, they are on the periphery. Land is often represented as female in these narratives, and in film... More recently, space has become this new frontier, and it produces a new kind of hero. The conquest narrative becomes one about coexistence. Um, and by the way, we should keep in mind that the fly can also be read as a frontier narrative, I think. I think uh, when Brundle is sitting down with um, Ronnie, he even uses the... <coughs> excuse me, he even uses the word frontier to describe what his machine is attempting to eliminate, right, or conquer... I guess, um, the frontier between time and space by making um, teleportation possible. Um, so one question we could ask, and one, one thing you could think about for this week, too, is um, how might Rushing's reading also apply to a film like The Fly, even though she only talks about aliens? Um, so Rushing points out that before patriarchy gave rise to the frontier myth, the archetype of the Great Mother prevailed as a figure who was not defined in relation to a man. The feminine in the frontier myth is defined by a principle of gratification. Ancient mythology has examples of women who are not defined by their relationship to men. The Great Mother is an example because she can be both lover and virgin without losing her identity, and is complete as one in herself. She can also be a warrior, um, she is dominant over Dionysus in ancient times. She honors and accepts the impulses that later patriarchal, patriarchal cultures seek to suppress as sinful desires. So Rushing argues that the feminine does not receive its identity in relation to men in this older structure, right? <coughs> With the rise of patriarchy, however, comes this new hero of the masculine ego. The ego hero fights the mother goddess... The mother not only releases the ego with the fight and is therefore represented as monstrous. The great mother divides into a good mother defined as conscious and the bad mother defined as unconscious. 
Under patriarchy, the good woman becomes chaste and the property of men. The good virgin Mary, or the good virgin, um, is a diminished version of the original goddess, who was complete in herself. Mary, in Christian theology, is defined in relation to a man as both a virgin and a mother. Uh, the feminine principle in patriarchal cultures associates the pure virgin good mother with the upper world and conscious world, whereas the harlot devouring mother is associated with the underworld and the unconscious world. The patriarchal hero now develops into the one god. Under the patriarchal god, Dionysian pleasures of the want, um, which can include sex and drinking, right, are repressed so that aggression and desire are re recast as evils to conquer rather than as natural elements to embrace as the good mother once did. The frontiersman faces infantile containment versus active penetration of that containment. The archetypal hero leaves behind the mother to defeat the, the devouring mother. The hero is angry with the mother for preventing his penetration into the frontier, according to this narrative structure that she's outlining. Rushing also contrasts the masculine and feminine myth structures. In a masculine search narrative, the man seeks the feminine he has expelled, and this becomes a quest narrative. In a female search narrative, the goddess strives to reunite herself with her lost half. The female quest involves a descent where she meets her dark counterpart, suffers disintegration, and is devoured in order to be reborn as a transformed being. And I want you to keep in, keep this article in mind later in this um, in a few weeks when we watch a film which is called The Descent, right? Which is very much what is going on in that film. Um, Rushing is pretty much describing that film here. <laughs> the formula for a descent female search narrative um, is that the upper world goddess must accept the underworld half to be made whole. So, in, in this sense, Ripley is able to see herself in the alien mother um, and identifies with her as a mother of, of Newt, or as a mother who has, recent, who has lost her own child, um, in the same way that the alien is a mother of, of these eggs that she's laying, right? The tyranny of patriarchy, however, unravels in space, and Rushing anticipates that quest and descent myths will reappear as the frontier narrative focuses more on outer space and less on patriarchal land frontiers. So whereas a horizon is dominable in land-based frontier narratives like the Western, um, the globe is a more infinite and transcendental in a space frontier. Um, space as the new frontier shifts the feminine as a whole, so the quest and descent structure will reemerge. And Rushing reads aliens as a fledgling archetype descent myth of the new frontier. She also contrasts feminist celebrations of these films with critiques of the film, like Barbara Creed's, who sees the archaic mother associated with the horrific, which in turn reaffirms patriarchy's disgust with the feminine. Um, by the way, I've included Creed's reading of the film Alien um, in the supplemental reading for this week, so if anybody's interested, feel free to look at that. Rushing, however, in contrast to Creed's reading, argues that these films reaffirm a feminine principle by subverting a patriarchal consciousness and introducing the descent motif into the new frontier. Um, the film also mixes the descent and hero myth, so the schism in the goddess is not healed and the feminine is subverted. So she's saying that this is, in Aliens, there's kind of a blending of these two um, gendered myths going on. There's both a descent, but also... Features of the hero myth. Rushing shows how the descent narrative functions in the film. So Ripley must descend to rescue Newt. The, the film celebrates this mother-daughter bond. Um, Newt and Ripley are the only ones with enough wit and strength to survive. Rushing reads, these, reads the alien films as feminist, whereas I think the other critics who we've looked at for this week would not. <clears throat> the sequel... Aliens is more anti-patriarchal than the first film. The military patriarchy is represented as disorganized and impotent. 
Ripley embodies the military industrial complex. She becomes a fighting machine. She becomes the masculine ego hero when she battles the monstrous mother, which is, again, where Rushing sees the blending of um, these two kinds of myths going on. Rushing also argues that the monster is not only a projection of patriarchal fear of the archaic mother. Um, sorry, Rushing, Rushing's point... Yeah, is that the mother is not only a projection of patriarchal fear in the archaic mother, which is sort of how Creed is reading this film. And she points out how such a reading overlooks the frontier narrative structure. Um, and I think this is a really important and smart intervention into this debate. Um, in short, she seems to make room for a discussion of capitalistic and environmental exploitation for profit, which which psychodynamic frameworks wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be concerned with. Um, and I think this is smart, partly because I'm interested in sort of eco-critical investigations of um, film and literature. But she points out how the, terra the terraformers, the whole point of being on this planet in this film, is to exploit the land and the frontier for profit. The goddess is a horrible symbol of male fear and reabsorption, but at the same time, it is also horrible because she is reacting to patriarchal exploitation of her domain, which I think is a crucial point. Um, the terror she strikes in men is not just a projection of masculine fear, but a reaction. And I think Rushing is suggesting that it's also a justified reaction <coughs> to patriarchal exploitation. The alien mother is the devouring goddess, complete in itself. It's independent and outside the patriarchal narrative, which is why she is so terrifying to the, to the men, right? She disorients the men who hunt for her. The monstrous mother takes back the sacred places of patriarchy. Monstrous birth from a man in the sequel parodies the rape and ruin of the frontier being performed by the men. And I think that's a great reading, too, of, of seeing these aliens burst out of not, not necessarily women's chests, but... Um, male chests in, in the first movie and in this, this one. <coughs> the goddess has regency in a male quest narrative. She provides a warning to the ego against the persistence of raping space. But the men on the ship trivialize and ignore the warnings against exploitation. The men represent their mission as a cavalier rape. They cannot nuke it because of the investment interests. The men are unaware that the enemy has multiplied. The women, on the other hand, Ripley and Newt in particular, are conscious of the aliens and their threats. They are respectful of them, worthy opponents, and survivors. The film emphasizes Ripley as maternal as she transforms into the good mother with Newt and becomes a complete in herself figure, not maternal in relation to a man, but maternal in relation to an orphan, a female orphan. Um, in this way, Ripley also becomes a, a mother again, complete after the loss of her daughter at the beginning of the film. Um, Ripley must descend to rescue Newt. The film celebrates this mother-daughter bond. Newt and Ripley are the only ones with wit and strength to survive. Rushing reads these as feminist films. Um, so my qu one of my questions for you is, where do you stand on this debate? Is this a feminist film? Um, personally, I find Rushing's argument very convincing, but I also think that Williams and even, even Mulvey have some, and Creed, um, have some, some weight here. So to end this, I, I just have some questions I, which you can think about and perhaps respond to in your um, close reading posts for this week. So first, we've sort of went over how Mulvey and Williams are dealing with psychodynamic approaches, how Freeland is offering this more gender ideology <coughs> framework um, for feminist critiques of horror films, and finally Rushing, who's looking at femini feminist feminine archetypes and in a frontier narrative. So one question we can ask is, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of these three different kinds of approaches, um, and what are some examples you can point to from the films? Second, um, how might Rushing's argument extend to the fly? Is there a way to read the descent narrative in the fly? Can it be read as a frontier narrative insofar as 
Brundle is trying to conquer and overcome movement between spaces? Is he trying to tackle the frontier itself? And do we de- do we see some sort of descent being mixed with the quest in that film? Um, another question we could ask is, how does Freeland's argument about gender ideology extend to aliens? How might gender ideology work in aliens? What would Freeland argue, would Freeland argue this is a feminist movie? Um... Or is Ripley still being sexually objectified and equated with the monstrous other mother, right? Does her role as a soldier only allow her to become a a nurturing mother in the end? Or is she furthering the plot somehow? Also, is she represented in a positive way? Um, Also, how are the Fly and Frankenstein similar in their narrative structures? Or thinking back to, to body genres... Um, what are the consequences of men attempting to create new life out of fragmented bodies without women? Um, And this question sort of emerges at one point in The Fly, Brundle says to that woman he picks up at the bar, she she asks him, are you a bodybuilder? And he says, yes, I I build bodies. I take them apart and put put them back together again, which is kind of a very Frankensteinian um, reply. So... I'm interested to know how you would compare this film and and the novel so far. Um, another question, how does the fly speak to anxieties about aid, the AIDS ec- epidemic, as Freeland suggests? Does Brundlefly's condition imitate or resemble symptoms of AIDS victims? And can the fly be read as a feminist film? Is is What is this film's message about abortion or a woman's right to choose? Um... I guess I'm wondering if there's something feminist in the way the fly seems to characterize as monstrous in terms of Brundlefly, the man who seeks to stop a woman from having an abortion. Or, in the case of Ronnie's dream, where she's actually going through with the abortion, um, the man, her editor, Stathis, who insists that she have one, is there something monstrous about him sort of making her go through with it? Um, so what is this film's message about abortion? Um, also, it's not as though Stathis is the real hero in the end, even though he does prevent um, Ronnie from being fused with Brundlefly by sort of shooting the... severing the connection at the last minute. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah, there's so many questions about these films and these very rich readings for this week. So I'm very excited to see what you guys come up with. Um, and I look forward to reading your responses. Thank you.